Good afternoon and welcome to a Euractive hybrid conference in partnership with Gas Infrastructure Europe. I'm Mariam Zaid. I'll be moderating today's debate on security of gas supply and what role for gas infrastructure. A big welcome to our in-person audience. Thanks for being with us um, this afternoon. And hello to, to our online audience. Um, now, at Euractive, as I'm sure you are all well aware of, you follow all of our debates, um, we really like to get the audience involved um, with our debates. If you have a question, whether you're sitting here in person or you're watching online, do send it into our Slido chat page um, and we will keep picking out your questions during the debate. So do start thinking about your questions and perhaps send in some questions starting now. Also, if you want to follow the debate and tweet us, use the hashtag EADebates. So given the energy crisis, we really couldn't be having a more important discussion today. The security of European gas supply has never been more at threat. Here's the current state of play. Russia, as we all are well aware of, if you follow all of this, um, it has long supplied the EU with 40% of its gas. Given that heavy reliance, Russia is using natural gas, so what we use to heat our homes, as a political and economic weapon in the war in Ukraine. Gas prices are, of course, skyrocketing, especially at the petrol pump, where sadly, records are being broken daily. All of this threatens our global energy security, especially as we look towards winter. Now, given the war and given the Russian stranglehold on our energy supply, Europe is looking to cut its dependence on Russian fossil fuels by two thirds by 2023 under its repower EU plans. It comes at a time when Russia is also cutting gas supplies to EU countries by 60% in some cases. We have our member state, Germany, preparing for a gas war and activating stage two of its emergency plans. It comes at a time when, you know, the picture is really feeling pretty bleak, especially as European countries like Germany and the Netherlands are also turning back towards coal. Is this needs must or is it climate hypocrisy? And that's definitely something we will be discussing a late, bit later on. So how can we then repower Europe without Russian energy and maintain our climate ambitions? Well, let's ask the experts. So... Joining us today are Tomasz Prusa. He's a special envoy for the Czech presidency at the Ministry of Industry and Trade. We also have MEP Jerzy Buzek. He's a member of the ITRA Industry Committee at the European Parliament. Um, in person, we have Marcia Novetsky, Rapporteur on the Opinion on Gas Storage at the EESC. That's the European Economic Social Committee. Also joining in person is Alex Barnes, a Visiting Research Fellow at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. We have Vincent de Moury. He's the Secretary General for GIIGNL. That's the International Group of LNG Importers. And Peter Van Arsen. He's on the board member of Gas Infrastructure Europe. Okay, well, welcome to you all, um, especially to our panelists who are joining online and now to understand a little bit about what they all advocate for. I'll give them all a few minutes to sort of introduce themselves and set out their stall. We'll start off with Tomasz Prusa. Please take the floor, please. Mariam, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, in a way, the discussion is a deja vu. Uh, I think here she will remember that the first Czech presidency started in 2009 with a gas crisis. Uh, we're starting the second Czech presidency with a gas crisis, but um, much more complicated gas crisis than that. Um, primarily because we have not learned our lessons. We haven't learned the lessons from 2009. We haven't learned the lesson from the 2014 annexation of Crimea. and. Uh, the situation when uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin is weaponizing gas uh, is, of course, a huge challenge uh, given also the much more complicated economic environment than there was in uh, 2009. We see many member states now having at least the partial disruptions uh, of inflow of uh, gas from Russia. Uh, we are also waiting uh, what will happen in mid-July after the traditional uh, technical uh, supervision of Nord Stream 1, whether uh, the flow will be then restarted or whether uh, July 21st will be a cut of date uh, for significant parts of uh, the EU with the Russian gas. Knowing that there is no quick solution, there's no quick um, immediate alternative. So, I mean, the lesson topic number one also for the Czech presidency will be uh, how to translate the word solidarity into practical arrangements. 
because that coming winter uh, will be a huge challenge uh, so far. Solidarity is in everybody's words, but then the practical translation will be important. I'm glad we managed to push at least one of the things um, on Monday at the Energy Council, and that was now the EU-wide rules for filling up uh, gas uh, tank storages. Uh, we started these activities in March in the Czech Republic. Now it has become an EY goal. I think that is what very important. The second uh, important thing is then also looking a bit more uh, forward and um, how we take uh, what do we do after this winter. And yes, most of the political focus will be on this winter, making sure people don't freeze and the businesses can operate as long as possible. But I think we also need to keep in mind two things. One, having significant sufficient investment uh, capabilities to build uh, the infrastructure because that was maybe the problem in the past. Infrastructure that made security sense but did not make a business sense was not built and that is something I think we finally understand we need to change and we need to invest into security. Second point, making sure that whatever we build is hydrogen ready. I think we don't want to have any sunk assets uh, and we need to make sure that if we also believe that most of the hydrogen for the EU economies will be important, then we have the infrastructure, we have the partnership, but also that we simply do not uh, replace dependence on Russia with dependence on somebody else who can then start playing uh, similar games. So that would be the two key priorities for the Czech presidency, having the short arrangements on uh, solidarity and making sure that when we talk about uh, de-russification and decarbonization, we also put the money where all the words are. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Prusa, and very important points you're making there, um, and also saying that lessons haven't been learned. Okay, over to our MEP, Yezi Busek. Please take the floor for a few minutes. A few minutes. Mr. Busek, please go ahead, please. Mr. Busek, please go ahead, please. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. It is time for me. Uh, congratulations uh, to uh, Czech's presidency. Uh, you know, 13 years ago, during the time of first presidency, you went to 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 uh, to into the direction of third energy package, and you uh, received a great result. So congratulations for that, and I wish you the same results just now. Uh, short introduction introduction from my my side. I think what is very important. Uh, I think, well, security of gas supply and role for gas infrastructure. I am thinking about that, the main topic of our discussion. Uh, so, delegated act to the taxonomy regulation, important issue. We will vote next week and it will define the future of gas in the EU, conditions for further financing of such investments or a clear deadline from when new gas installation will have to burn only renewable gases. And uh, it is, a, fr from my perspective, a not good result of first voting in two committees of European Parliament, NV and ECON, Environment and uh, Economy uh, Committee, and they were against Delegated Act. I will fight for saying yes for delegated act and for future of gas sector and also gas uh, investment in new infrastructure in gas. Not too, too many of uh, gas pipelines, maybe an LNG, but still is necessary. Medium term perspective, of course, gas storage. Uh, I was responsible as a leader of negotiating team uh, for all our, our regulation. We finished all the work in three weeks. Since the beginning, European Commission at the end, and tomorrow it will work. Could you imagine European Union, Union such an important legislative proposal completely finished since the beginning to the end in three months. It is about uh, how to fill our um, storage capacities uh, until 1st of November, 85%. We should do it as soon as possible. Uh, and uh, we can also um, go towards joint purchasing mechanism of gas. We are waiting 12 years for that in the European Parliament. 
uh, member states uh, didn't want to agree. And uh, uh, storage is uh, in the energy community countries, for example, Ukraine is absolutely possible. Uh, and um, well, the possibility of reduction uh, of up to 100% in LNG tariffs, for example, a certification of, uh, of ownership, we would like to, 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 to um, have uh, such a situation like, uh, like, like, like uh, last autumn, uh, storages in the Russian hand, uh, and hands, and at the end, 20-25% uh, of capacity was built up with gas. And uh, very shortly, long-term perspective, it's very important to mention hydrogen and gas package. I am responsible with the environment for this package. Some questions, very important, maybe we can answer during our discussion, because it's about uh, gas infrastructure, as a matter of fact. Whether and to what extent to use the existing gas infrastructure for hydrogen, very important. Uh, uh, stranded assets, very important issue. Uh, whether to allow blending of hydrogen with gas, in my opinion, on a uh, last resort. How to fill, as soon as possible, uh, the still existing gaps in the EU gas infrastructure. For example, between Spain and, and France, to send gas from, uh, from uh, Spain uh, to Germany, um, to France. And uh, why that issue, which is very important, if we should use uh, Russian gas to fill our our uh, storage capacities. So a lot of questions, and I think uh, from that perspective, gas infrastructure is absolutely crucial. Without infrastructure, of course, we cannot do anything. But how to use it in the future? Future-proof infrastructure for ammonia, for hydrogen. All the questions are in front of us, also in the time of our discussion. That does now. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Buzek. Um, so and it was good that you talked there about hydrogen because that's definitely something that we will be talking about a lot later. And also EU taxonomy at the European uh, Parliament in Strasbourg and that very important vote. Um, okay, over to uh, Marcin Novatsky, Rapporteur on the opinion on gas storage at the EESC. Please do take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to, to Prime Minister Bozek for his uh, uh, heavy involvement in the, in the issue uh, overall uh, energy, energy sector in Europe. I must say that I come from the country that uh, where the lesson was learned, uh, and I'm glad to say that as not, not um, being a politician, that regardless of government, of uh, party uh, in power for the last 17 years, uh, we have done a number of projects in terms of infrastructure contracts, and the infrastructure covers all sorts of uh, uh, of, uh, of, of projects, uh, starting from interconnectors, large gas pipelines such as the Baltic Pipe, and, uh, and the LNG uh, terminal, and then the, even the phase two of the LNG terminal in Świnoujście, uh, planning of a floating terminal next to Gdańsk, uh, large interconnector with, um, with Baltics, with Lithuania, from Kuiperda all the way to Warsaw. It was just open on the 1st of May. Uh, we're just about to open another one with Slovakia. We're back to the table with the, uh, with the Czech government discussing mm, our connections. So uh, I'm glad that the region uh, uh, did, uh, did uh, their job in terms of the gas infrastructure and the way uh, we are able today to differentiate uh, our supplies. And we'll be, we've been asking for that uh, other member states for years, actually from uh, for, for, for last two decades to, to work into that direction. Unfortunately, across uh, the EU, we have, uh, we have a greater dependency on Russia than it was uh, 20 or 10 years ago. Uh, so the problem is not to have uh, you know, gas from a, uh, from a number of directions, uh, even from Russia, the problem is the heavy dependency and the level uh, of, of supplies. Please remember that most of uh, Russian natural gas is sold to the EU, most of it. 
uh, if that's, uh, th that would be 20%, uh, 25%, then we would be all safe and we can easily uh, and in a uh, 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 short period of time change our supply. Uh, I agree that uh, the gas infrastructure is, is critical. Uh, we worked recently on the gas storage, uh, but uh, gas storage is nothing without uh, other uh, gas infrastructure such as uh, pipelines, interconnectors. We need to connect ourselves internally and I believe that the natural gas uh, will uh, stay in Europe and worldwide for years to come. I don't think it's a short-term perspective that we're going to mm, uh, move away from the gas, from the natural gas. So all the investments that are planned now, all the new discussions that are uh, happening uh, should be continued and uh, the, the infrastructure should be uh, built uh, I wouldn't be worried about new suppliers as long as they do not have that uh, large presence as, as uh, Russia today. Again, if we have 10, 15, 20, 20 up to 25 percent of a, of a gas coming from one uh, supplier, we rather save as long as we have the infrastructure internally within the EU uh, to support ourselves. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and, you know, you're talking about heavy dependence being an issue that you can't just replace Russia with someone else. I think that's an important um, point that I think other um, panellists are also raising. Okay, Alex Barnes, over to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Alex Barnes at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. I would fully agree that the point is this is a supply crisis in the sense that, you know, the major supplier to Europe is now both threat threatening Europe and also threatening to cut off gas supplies. Um, if you want to understand about the supply picture, I suggest you look at uh, various studies by my colleagues, Mike Fullwood and Jack Sharples. There's a lot of good detail in there. But to give you a sense of the scale of the issue, um, most of the replacement gas that we will try and source in Europe will be in the form of LNG, liquefied natural gas. That comes from a variety of suppliers. But the total traded market for LNG in 2021 Russian supply to Europe was about a third of that. So that's a big chunk to replace, and that takes time. LNG projects, there's plenty of gas in the ground. It's more a question of the time that it takes to build the new projects, the liquefaction plants, the ships, and to a certain extent, the regas terminals. I don't agree that lessons weren't learned from 2009. In fact, actually, the EU did some very sensible stuff after 2009. They passed something called the Gas Security of Supply Regulation that required there to be better infrastructure. So prior to then, most gas supplies in Europe flowed from east to west, because, of course, it flows from Russia into Eastern Europe. What the gas regulation, uh, security of supply regulation did, it said you have to enable those pipelines to flow in both directions. So you can now flow gas, for example, through Germany into Poland. You can flow gas through Germany into the Czech Republic and Slovakia. You couldn't do that before. They also said that you had to put in big enough pipelines so that you could cope with the disruption of your biggest single source of supply. And of course, you know, that's something. What we do have today, though, is that the scenarios that were planned on basically looked at interruption from one or two uh, pipelines in isolation. They didn't envisage interrupting all the supply at one point. But we are actually in a much better off position than we were before. And the coordination plans that a couple of people mentioned in terms of Germany emergency plans, those are now a lot better. So 10 years ago, most countries' emergency plans sort of said, oh, well, we'll get our gas from our neighbor. Well, that doesn't work if your neighbor also has a gas shortage. That is now much better, but it needs to be improved. And then the last point I'd like to make is that we need to stop thinking about infrastructure as a creator of demand. As a couple of the speakers have said, it's an enabler of demand. It doesn't mean that you create dependence on a particular source of gas. It just means that you enable gas to get from where you get it, where it's supplied from, to where it's needed. And when I hear talk about stranded assets, of course we need to be careful not to have stranded assets. But frankly speaking, the cost of stranded assets is probably quite small compared to the cost of being cut off in the middle of winter. So I would argue that's, that's something to think about. Um, and I think, I think I will leave it there. Okay. Well, definitely lots, lots 
to discuss um, with you a bit later on. Um, over to Vincent Dumouri then, the Secretary General of GII GNL, International Group of LNG Importers. Please go ahead. Mr. Dumouri, would you like to go ahead, please? Thank you, Maria. Uh, yeah, uh, LNG importers, uh, we, we cover today uh, around 90% of global LNG. Okay, I think what we'll do is we'll go to Peter we'll Van Arsen. today about 90% of global LNG flows, so I'm happy to... Uh, yeah, I think what we'll do, uh, Mr. De Marie, I can see that your connection is a little bit um, slow. Um, so we'll go to Peter Van Arsen um, from Gas Infrastructure Europe, and then we'll come back to you. Mr. Van Arsen, please take the floor for a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Miriam. Thank you to your active for, for organizing this uh, debate. And I think that a, and you would need to a lot of good yourself. <laughs> I'm unmuted on my side. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, okay, good. Okay, thank you, Miriam. Uh, thank you, your active for uh, uh, for organizing the, uh, the the conference. And I think that a couple of good points have already been made by the by the speakers. Um, just to, to, to add from uh, for, from my side, of course, we are in an unprecedented crisis uh, to uh, today, um, and the energy market, of course, is one of those uh, especially hit by the uh, by the Russian uh, invasion into uh, into Ukraine. Um, but I think it's also important to, to realize that some of the problems that we've seen in the energy market uh, didn't start in February this year when the Russians actually uh, started their invasion, but were already present in the market uh, prior to that. Um, last winter, we already faced depleted storages or storages at uh, very low filling levels, uh, which of course caused stress in the, in the market and saw already unprecedented high gas prices. So I think that is an important thing to, to, to realize also moving forward that we uh, that this wasn't just uh, started uh, started then, and I think also some of the other speakers have alluded to that security of supply uh, might have been neglected to a certain bit, um, and maybe we have been uh, relying uh, uh, a bit too much that the supplies would always come towards uh, towards Europe. I would agree with Alex that I think that lessons have been learned. Transmission system operators have put in place those links that are vital or will be even more vital. Um, if the crisis deepens to bring gas from west to east. Those missing links that we saw in 2009 where the gas physically couldn't reach certain uh, parts of Europe uh, have uh, mainly been, uh, been, uh, been, been taken away. But I would say though is of course the thing that we will have to look at is that the plans that uh, Alex also referred to that have been developed at member state level and they are a very good step uh, in the right direction. Well I think we need to look and make sure that they're robust enough for a prolonged period without gas. Uh, they were mainly designed to cover for shorter periods um, during very high demand where an entry point in the system would fall away for a couple of days or maybe a week, maybe even a month. But um, of course, when you're talking about a complete stop of Russian gas flowing towards Europe, we are in a different territory. I think it is very good, um, and, and of course, Mr. Buzik, impressive uh, uh, work on the side of the European institutions in making sure that uh, legislation passed in in a couple of a couple of weeks. Um, so the gas storages are being filled uh, filled now. And I think that from the side of GIE, we have been also vocal uh, on the value of storage over the past couple of years. Um, that the asset is there, but of course, it is also for the market to make sure that it is being used in the right uh, in the right way. Maybe some something still then also on, on, on LNG, it will be a vital link. We have operational terminals in, in, in Europe um, that we see are already being used also quite extensive, uh, quite extensively. And I'm, I'm proud to, to and then I'll speak shortly on, on, on the, com the company I know, uh, I know best, which is uh, Ghazuni, uh, an operator in the Netherlands and Germany. Uh, we are putting in place also at record speed. Um, so not only the EU institutions are, are doing their utmost, but also from the side of the operators uh, by enabling uh, a substantial increase in LNG uh, imports with uh, floating uh, LNG terminal, uh, which will be operational by 15 of September this, uh, uh, this, uh, th this year. Um, I think it's no secret that also, of course, from the Czech side, uh, capacity actually has been booked in this terminal, enabling actually this investment to go, uh, to go ahead and thereby making sure that we can uh, 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 can hopefully mitigate as far as possible uh, a potential uh, a further deepening of the crisis. 
Then finally, short short word, I mean, we shouldn't forget in the, the energy transition. And I think Alex, you made a good point. I mean, the pipelines are neither, I would say neither fossil nor, uh, nor, nor, nor green as also electricity cables are neither fossil nor green. They are simply a way to be able to transport energy. Um, and whereas, uh, of course, on the electricity side, we see an uptake of renewables, for sure also the perspective for uh, for gas pipes is there to be able to use them in the future for uh, for hydrogen uh, uh, for hydrogen import to the to the question that Mr. Bruzek already raised, I'm quite sure that we'll touch upon that later as well. These pipes can be, uh, uh, depending a little bit uh, country by country, maybe, but to a very large extent, be reused uh, for uh, uh, for for hydrogen. And the same would certainly also apply for for the LNG uh, import terminal. So. Whether or not the stranded asset, I think that is a little bit too early to uh, uh, to actually conclude. Um, and I think it'll, that the, this crisis should also feel uh, as, as 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 a clear call to all of us to to work on the short term, but not lose the long term perspective out of you. Yeah, I think that's an important and final point to make to not lose that long term perspective as well. Um, okay, let's go back to Vincent de Mourier, please. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, I will try to build on what's uh, been said by previous speakers. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, to maybe reflect a little bit on the state of the market and especially on, on the, uh, the state of the LNG market. As was said, we are in a very tight uh, market and this, is, uh, this has been the case now uh, since several months. It didn't start with um, the Ukraine-Russia uh, crisis. Uh, the prices in Europe had already been multiplied by uh, five in the course of 2021, but the prices in Asia also had been uh, multiplied by, by four. So it really shows you that the, the issue uh, of uh, energy security and gas security has to be uh, considered uh, on a global scale and not only with a, with a Eurocentric uh, view. There is, of course, in the short term, the need to uh, replace uh, Russian gas. So it, it's been said at least one third with LNG uh, by 2023. We think that these targets are ambitious, that they could be reached under certain conditions, uh, which are not guaranteed at the moment, because the, 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 the liquefaction plants on one side are running uh, flat out, uh, especially in the United States. On the uh, uh, receiving side, the, 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 the terminals, especially in Western Europe, are also uh, working at, at full speed. And, and uh, it is not guaranteed how long this uh, state of, uh, of things can, uh, can last. Now, what we are seeing also is, of course, a, a restart of, uh, of coal in Europe, but not only in Europe, also in Asia. And that, that is the, the current market response, uh, which is, of course, a disaster for the energy transition. One thing I'd like to highlight also, because we are talking about infrastructure today, is uh, uh, the fact that LNG infrastructure uh, does not mandate new supply. It is not because you are building uh, new terminals and new capacity in Europe that you will get the volumes, simply because the, the, the market doesn't work that way. The LNG volumes respond to price signals on a global scale. When the prices are, are higher in Asia, the LNG will flow to Asia and, and uh, European players don't have any means to, to guarantee that these volumes will come to uh, European shores. So there are a number of, of uh, measures that can be taken to, uh, to ensure that. Uh, and maybe we will uh, discuss those later. But that, that's at least for the, the, the picture for the, for the short term. The good news is that LNG is flexible, can be supplied uh, from 19 countries, uh, can be delivered to 44 countries, uh, 44 markets in the world, and can be redirected uh, when it's not needed. Uh, but uh, once again, uh, today the issue is not so much on the receiving side. Europe is relatively well supplied in terms of terminals at least, although there are some uh, bottlenecks uh, that were mentioned in Spain, in the UK, where you cannot uh, flow the volumes uh, back to the continent and this would uh, require probably new uh, new investments. But today, really, the issue we see is more on the first on the supply side. How do we get these uh, new volumes, these uh, 100, 110 million tons of new supply, which would be needed to replace these, uh, these uh, volumes of Russian gas that usually uh, came to Europe? It's a $300 billion investment. Are we ready to commit uh, for such investment? Such, such amounts have been invested in the past uh, in, in, in infrastructure, so maybe we, we, we should look at that. And of course, the, the question in the longer term is how do we articulate uh, these investments with uh, the decarbonization trajectory uh, 
uh, that we are aiming for and how do we ensure that the infrastructure both the supply infrastructure the uh, shipping and the receiving infrastructure can be fit for uh, um, a decarbonized uh, future and that's an, another question that needs to be answered we we, we the, the LNG industry has some some ideas around that that are not already uh, implemented at scale uh, but we we believe that we can get there and at least we believe that without LNG, we 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 have the certainty that we won't be on the on a, a, a neutrality trajectory. What we are seeing today is that we are we will be simply displacing uh, LNG flows from Asia to Europe, creating more emissions in China, in in Korea, in Japan, and other countries which don't have the luxury to reduce uh, their energy demand. So that's the last point I'd like to make also on, on, on demand. Right now, governments are mostly acting on avoiding uh, price, right, pr price increases, trying to secure new volumes and new infrastructure. But uh, another level, which is very, uh, another level, sorry, which is very important to act on is, is of course, reducing uh, demand. And, and, and I think we will hear more of that. Uh, either uh, on a voluntary basis or, 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 or on a forced basis if we have uh, cuts of Russian gas. So these are the, the main points uh, I wanted to, uh, to make uh, to start uh, the discussion. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much, Mr. Demuri. Um, and I do see that lots of questions are coming into our chat page, so do please sending those in to all of us. Okay, so I know that all of you have given lots of your ideas, um, lots of questions also to be answered, but let's sort of set the scene a little um, with a very sort of, you know, basic sort of question. Is this the worst it has ever been? How bad, if you could sort of quantify it or assess it, how bad is the gas supply situation um, across Europe, especially with Germany, you know, one of our biggest member states sounding the alarm? And I'll go to Mr. Prusa first. You know, you were saying that, you know, lessons haven't been learned. I know that some of the other panelists said otherwise, but just how bad a situation is it? Uh, well, it's bad and good in a way. I think, yes, uh, it has not been probably as critical any time in the past. Uh, also, uh, Russia can make it much more critical very quickly, and I think they will play that game. So I think we are in uh, for a very rough winter, uh, especially if it's a cold one. But at the same time, uh, it's never been uh, so good, because for, I think for the first time, most governments understand they need to invest much more than in the past. Uh, I think we all understand uh, that we need to start here with the bottlenecks, uh, a couple of my colleagues mentioned, because uh, we still have the infrastructure problems. So that is the positive side of things. The problem is the bad part will come in two or three months. The good part will see the manifestation of uh, improving situation in two to three years down the road. So the biggest challenge I think we all face is the ability of politicians to keep a calm head and make sure that we can somehow manage uh, this complicated winter. And then that we'll, we will remember that for the next time, for the next two or three years. And that was basically what I meant, that the lessons have not been learned uh, effectively. That many of the investments we saw as needed in 2009 have been postponed and postponed again. So again, um, I'm not fully pessimistic, but I think uh, for the politicians uh, who definitely will have only the short-term focus for this winter, that will be the key challenge to keep reminding them they also need to think short long-term. Okay, uh, Mr. Novatsky wants to, to interject there, yeah. Uh, yeah. We uh, must remember that there were investments in place. Uh, uh, I think of uh, Nord Stream, Nord Stream 2. Uh, super heavy investments without any business case. Uh, <laughs> the direction was wrong and, and uh, the goals uh, were, were different. These were political goals that are used right now. So uh, there were some really heavy investments uh, with number of member states involved. So it's now time to shift and really differentiate, differ from what was uh, in the past. Uh, what I meant about uh, lessons uh, uh, were learned I meant about the region, uh, especially Poland and Baltic states, that's definitely the case. Uh, but as it was uh, mentioned in terms of the industry, there, there were a number of projects also uh, elsewhere. Thank you. Um, 
I think it's important to separate out the infrastructure from the supply. The point on the infrastructure is that it is not perfect. There are still bottlenecks, but it's a lot better than it was in 2009. You can put LNG into the UK, flow it through the interconnectors, and then flow it across Europe to Eastern, uh, to Eastern Europe. You couldn't do that in 2009. So that's the good news. The bad news is that, yes, this is a really serious crisis. It is as serious as we've seen it in the gas industry, and I'll say why. Firstly, prices are at incredibly high levels. I've never seen that, and I've been in the industry for nearly 30 years. The second, so that's already causing a lot of pain. I mean, gas bills in the UK have basically, you know, utility bills have basically doubled, and that's all been driven by gas prices, whether it's gas directly or it's electricity. So, that, so that's already causing pain. Yeah, very, very bleak picture in the UK. Um, it, yeah. And it's bleak everywhere. Every, yeah. everywhere. Everybody's paying the same gas prices. It's one of the beauties about the gas market in Europe. It works. So prices set the signals. And if there's more demand than supply, then guess what? Prices go up. So we're all going to suffer from these very high prices. How much government shield us through subsidy is another matter. But the real problem is, as I say, about, about the, the, the supply side, and if Russia decides to either limit, uh, limit supply more or cut it off completely, we're going to find it extremely difficult. The repower EU plans are great, but as you'll see from analysis from some of my colleagues, they're very challenging. And a couple of people mentioned about moderating demand. If you compare, say, the California electricity crisis of 2000, 2001, when they had blackouts, or Japan in Fukushima, uh, after the Fukushima crisis, when they lost a lot of their electricity supply, they eventually took major steps to reduce demand of electricity in that case. Well, in our case, if you leave a light on, you're making the crisis work because so much of our uh, power is gas fired generation. If you're heating your home too hot or heating it when you're not there, you're accelerating the gas crisis. Anything you can do to reduce demand now will enable gas to go into storage and will make winter better. And that message, I mean, frankly speaking, I hear lots of talk about subsidies for consumers, and I understand why, but I hear very little about addressing the serious uh, the demand, because that's the, that's the one bit we can actually control as consumers. We have very little control over supply because it takes time for new supply to come on. Follow-up question. Is Repower EU, then, a little bit too ambitious in terms of the timing that they want certain targets to be met? <sighs> It's not ambitious in terms of the timing. It's just ambitious as to whether you think it, it can be it can be met, and and there are a lot of, there are a lot of assumptions in that. So to give an example on energy efficiency and rollout of heat pumps, for example, to, which are two related issues, on energy efficiency, the only reason that the EU met its 2020 energy efficiency targets, in other words, using less energy for the amount of economic output, was because of COVID. And interesting enough, things like transport and domestic buildings and stuff, energy efficiency was, performance was very poor. In terms of rolling out of heat pumps, um, I know from personal experience, because uh, I, I, uh, a house which um, my partner owns has a heat pump in, it's complicated to install them and it takes time to install them. So I'm not, so I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with the Repower EU in terms of ambition. I think, yes, absolutely. I'm just saying that, you know, these things take a take time and people need to recognize that we need to do everything we can and that includes on the demand situation. Right, I'll come to Mr. Bizek then. So as you were he hearing from Alex, you know, he's saying that, you know, all of these new plans will of course take time. So a question for you, will Europe actually be able to rely on Russian deliveries to stock up by winter? Mr. Buzik, is Mr. Buzik, to is go ahead, please. Could you repeat the question? Because uh, yes, of course, of course. Um, yes, so of course, Alex here was uh, talking about um, the time that it'll take to put, you know, programs such as you know Repower EU into place. So can Europe then still rely on Russian deliveries to stock up for winter? Can you paint that picture for us? What's going to happen in terms of gas supplies for winter? Well. Uh, let me let me add at the beginning that um, current crisis is much more serious than the crisis 13 years ago, and uh, 
in those times, we were not prepared at all. And in Slovakia and Bulgaria, we had zero centigrade in hospitals for more than two or three weeks. Horrible situation. And now it is very important that security of gas supply regulation is working all the time. We've got our coordination group working 24 hours a day, and we can prepare for some kind of, uh, uh, of crisis, gas, um, gas um, uh, crisis. And from, from the point of view of Russia and uh, sending gas to Europe, uh, let me say, if we uh, could fill our storage capacities up to 85%, which is still possible, is not quite sure, but possible, because now it's 50, 57% uh, for and It means, so it's uh, quite, a, quite a reasonable effect now. And in such a case, it will be rather secure for the whole winter because we could use our storage capacities, it means about 100 billion uh, cubic meters, more or less, uh, for less than one and a half months, even not uh, any supply from the third countries. And uh, of course, uh, uh, if it is not possible to fill in 85%, such a possibility also exists, unfortunately, it will be much more difficult. And um, in the case of such a country like Poland, if we open gas supply from Norway and from, from Denmark in a few months, it will be a rather secure situation. So maybe it will be necessary for Poland to support Czech Republic or Slovakia if there are uh, gas shortage, uh, shortages uh, during the winter, maybe even Germany, because uh, supply for Germany is the biggest problem. We should take into account that Finland is in 100% dependent on a Russia supply of gas. But it's a not big problem because they need uh, such an amount of gas yearly, almost nothing from the point of view of European, I know it could be some problems for, for Finnish people, of course, or Finland could be a problem, but it's not a big European problem. In the case of Germany, if it is dependent 40% even, it is an enormous amount of gas because it is uh, tens of billions of cubic meters per year. So it's very different. So from this point of view, infrastructure, because we discussed infrastructure issue in the regulation on on uh, gas storage, finished. We finished uh, two days, a uh, few days ago. Tomorrow will be working. And uh, from that perspective, we decided uh, first time on infrastructure that uh, probably we should go towards a new infrastructure. Uh, it is in recitals only, but still, it is a very big suggestion. In the Recover EU, we've got the next suggestion. So such um, interconnectors like Bulgaria, Greece, or Slovenia, Austria, or of course the most important uh, Spain, near France, uh, would be necessary to build in near future, probably, uh, because we've got enough gas, as a matter of fact, for our disposal, thanks to LNG terminals. Uh, but uh, is not enough possibility to send it to all member states, especially to Germany and our Austria as well. So we should uh, take care about that. And gas coordination group, working all the days, nights, uh, and uh, weekends, and so on, so on, should decide in which direction how we should uh, manage with the whole uh, issue for the future. It is probably not easy, but generally speaking, we are well prepared for such a situation in the European Union. And I think I am optimistic, generally speaking, and I hope that it will be working in the future. All the best to the Czech presidency, because it will be very important, your work for Javier uh, just now. And um, let me add at the end, 
that is very important that we use all the possibilities uh, to to contact between the member states within of of course acer and and so g should work all the time on the issue because uh, from point of view of gas infrastructure not everything is ready yet and we will try to vote for taxonomy in few days because it will be also helpful but in perspective of two three years not in perspective of few months because uh, if you ask about that we've got uh, two perspectives is uh, just a uh, uh, winter which is in in front of us in half a year very short time perspective and you should be ready absolutely to do everything what is possible and two three four years and from that point of view uh, medium medium term perspective i'm rather optimistic Mr. Buzik, if I could just quickly interject, um, I know that lots of the panellists want to um, follow up on what you're saying. Um, in terms of the panellists, I will go to uh, Peter Van Arsen after Mr. Buzik. But just a quick question on um, taxonomy then. Um, critics say it greenwashes natural gas and nuclear. What are your thoughts? And I think Mr. Buzik has currently... Ms. Mr. Buzik, if you can hear me, so your thoughts on the greenwashing... Um, when it comes to EU taxonomy, please. Okay, unfortunately, we've left. Um, perhaps you'd like to s have a word? Yeah, go ahead, Alex. <laughs> Happy to talk about the taxonomy. For those who don't know what the taxonomy is, it's a way of categorizing uh, different economic activities and basically saying whether or not they're sustainable. And sustainable is based on a number of things, not just whether you uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but also in things like pollution. And the idea, which I think is a good one, is that you have a set of standards of which against companies can report to say how much of their activities are environmentally friendly, sustainable or not. Um, so that's the background. Wh as I understand it, it doesn't actually stop you investing in non-sustainable activities. In fact, a lot of our activities today, you could argue, are non-sustainable in the long term, but we're going to continue to need them for some time. It simply says, if you're saying that you're producing X percent of your revenues as green or sustainable activities, you have to meet these standards. The debate about gas and nuclear has been about whether gas and nuclear can be seen to contributing to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Now, the, case, the, 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 the argument over nuclear is basically to do with nuclear waste, because obviously nuclear doesn't produce any greenhouse gas emissions. The argument over gas is basically about whether gas can be seen as contributing to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the short and medium term as we transition and build enough renewables. Um, to be honest, I, th I, th I think it's, uh, it's, it's a slightly arcane debate. Right. I, th I think actually, if, y if you just focus on the fact saying this is green or this is not, then that's good. But don't sort of use it as a, as a cudgel to beat people with and say you can't invest in, in gas or indeed nuclear. Because we are going to need gas, or put it this way, we'd much rather have gas than be burning coal, and certainly burning gas rather than burning lignite in the next few years if we want to meet our greenhouse gas targets. So I think you've got to, you've got to try and look at the context and try and take a balanced view as to what you're trying to do. Okay, so you say with taxonomy, it's about balance and context. Um, Mr. Buzek, your thoughts then? Um, Mr. Buzek, your thoughts? We were talking about EU taxonomy and whether it's Hello. right we or... I, I don't hear anything. Okay, well, unfortunately, this is the problem when we are having um, panellists joining online. Uh, Mr. Buzik, can we try to go to you? We're talking about EU taxonomy. No. Okay. Um, while Mr. Buzik... Um, um, you know, does try to reconnect um, and, and sort things out. And our team will, of course, be working with Mr. Buzik to do that. Um, let's go to Peter Van Arsen. So your thoughts then? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Miriam. Um, I think I'll explain the picture perfectly. And I think that, that, that of course, when it comes to reporting purposes, uh, that, that, that is one thing. Um, I think from the side of the industry, uh, one of the concerns that have been uh, voiced uh, is, is that ultimately uh, this also deals with uh, being able to attract as a company the financing needed for certain investments. And that is the knock-on effect uh, or the possible knock-on effect 
of uh, the uh, uh, the rules that are uh, currently being, uh, being 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 discussed. I think that there we should tread indeed very carefully uh, and make sure that we can make those investments in Europe to enable the security of supply. Um, and I think that that, that also looking uh, looking from the perspective indeed, depending where you are in Europe, um, maybe in northwestern Europe, where of course before the decisions in Germany and uh, and the Netherlands to to, to actually allow an increase in coal-fired uh, power generation, uh, but actually reducing these coal emissions by gas is actually contributing real life, real term in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in bringing down those, uh, those CO2 emissions. But as Alex indeed pointed out, um, we are in, uh, in a different uh, territory now, uh, of course, uh, than, 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 than when this debate was started. And I hope also that the colleagues of Mr. Buzak will take that into account when they are going to vote uh, on uh, on this file uh, this week. Okay, um, you mentioned coal, um, and coal has, of course, been um, discussed or you know mentioned a few times by the panelists. Um, so, Thomas Prusa, then. Um, one of the Czech presidency's top priorities is, of course, to cut Russian fossil fuel dependency. But it, when we have countries like Germany and the Netherlands, you know, firing back up, uh, going back to coal, is it really a needs must or is it climate hypocrisy? What's your take? I mean, is this really the right move to Europe and how much of a bad example is it setting, you know, third countries? Well, you know, I've seen a bit of hypocrisy uh, in the taxonomy discussions we're having right now. Uh, you see that some taboos are off the table. Uh, now it's perfectly acceptable to burn coal uh, in many countries that have always been talking about uh, climate change. But it's um, not okay to uh, use nuclear as a source, at least from the point of uh, CO2 emissions. That is, of course, much more sensible solution. So I think what we need, first of all, is that if we're removing taboos off the table, we need to remove all of them, not only some that fit uh, a specific member state uh, because they have a technology and they have the resources. Uh, secondly, uh, I think, again, we need to be clear that uh, whatever changes we do, re-permitting using coal, uh, that we do it for the minimum, absolute minimum time necessary. That again, it is simply not postponing the necessary investments and saying, well, okay, Coal is fine this winter, maybe it will be fine even three winters down the road. I think we need to be very clear. It is a time-limited uh, short-term solution. Uh, and point number three is, again, try to explain this uh, to the public because uh, I think we get exactly the same question, uh, Mariam, you have just been asking. You know, How come some things are okay, which only a few months ago all the politicians were saying is not okay? So. We're also losing a little bit uh, the public discussion in that. And, uh, and we're making ourselves vulnerable when we push for the changes uh, that we don't know how to explain it to the public. Confusing conversation. And I know that you wanted to jump in. Conversation. And I know that you wanted Definitely, uh, the taxonomy discussion is politically and business driven. There are, we must be bold. There are different interests. I mean, so far, there were the uh, has been different interests of member states in terms of technology uh, and and the kind of business perspective on uh, specific energy sources. Uh, nuclear is the greenest, the safest, uh, uh, stable technology we have, uh, and still the Germany decided to withdraw from this technology. At the same time, last year, 2021, Germany the number one uh, source of energy for Germany was coal, um, on the first position, uh, and getting rid uh, of, of, of nuclear. Taxonomy is important because of financing. Uh, if you go to the banking sector or you discuss EU, uh, EU funds, taxonomy will be critical. How to finance and at what cost to finance uh, infrastructure or, or facilities. So it is important, it's an important uh, play between uh, industries and, and politicians. But at the end of the day, it will uh, influence our energy dependency or independency and energy security. So we need to be really smart. And at that stage, we need to get rid of our uh, national interests of kind of technology uh, uh, lobbyists. We need to call what is what is what and nuclear is definitely 
uh, very important and very helpful. Okay. Um, I want to actually, I know lots of the panellists want to check. I know that Mr. Buzik wants to talk. I know that Mr. Um, Van Alsen wants to talk. But Vincent de Moury, I haven't heard from you in a bit. So I wanted to, you know, um, one of the panellists there was just discussing nuclear. Um, I don't know if you've heard this one, but VW's AG chief exec says the shift from Russian gas isn't happening fast enough to shield the German car maker from a sudden stop in natural gas deliveries. They're sourcing LNG, but infrastructure is not in place. So they're also turning back to coal. <laughs> Your thoughts? I mean, this shift back towards coal is, is, is it catastrophic? Of course it is catastrophic. I mean, and, and, and again, uh, let's not look at, at things only from a European perspective. It's, it's bringing a return on, on, of coal everywhere, in, 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 including in Asia very strongly. And I'd like to come back to uh, the, your question on uh, is the Repower EU um, uh, plan ambitious? Uh, or, or it's, it, it is ambitious, but for one reason, because maybe it's, it's not taking the, the, the problem from, from the right angle. I disagree with the fact that uh, there would be two perspectives, uh, one for the next winter and one for the next two to three winters. Um, and my question to, to all the panelists is, is what do we do in 2028, 20, uh, 2029, 20, 2030? Where, where we will get uh, uh, energy from? Are we going to get uh, Russian gas again? Or are we going to get uh, LNG? And in that case, where are we going to get that LNG from? So we hear um, uh, wishful thinking, uh, asking for more LNG volumes to come to Europe. But these volumes are simply not there today. They are uh, in the US only more than 160 million tons of projects waiting to get financed. However, on the European side, what the project developers hear is that uh, European uh, buyers will not commit uh, on, mo on a more than, than 10 year basis. How can you get a billion dollar uh, of investment finance on that basis? It's just simply impossible today. So um, the, the, the really, I'd like to, to highlight the fact that this is a severe crisis. It's not only an, an energy crisis, it's an economic crisis. It's a food crisis, not only in Europe, but also at the global level. And this needs to be tackled with uh, the right investments. And that, that's really the, 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 the and when, when I hear uh, the discussion about the taxonomy and the sustainability of gas versus coal uh, today, uh, or, or other forms of um, electricity generation, I, I, I feel a bit horrified because I think we are not taking the issue from the right angle. Now, from a regulatory perspective today, anything that can be done to, to alleviate uh, uh, to uh, restrictive regulatory measures to build new LNG infrastructure should be done. Today, if you are expanding an LNG terminal and you want to add, let's say, a, a vaporizer, the regulatory uncertainty is such that it will delay your project by at least six months, waiting for, for the, the, the right um, uh, response for, from the regulator. So we, we, we cannot afford to wait, uh, really. I want to, to bring that message that there is a, an urgency and that we, we need to tackle it right now. Okay, an urgency to tackle, um, a need to tackle it right now. Uh, Mr. Buzek, I'm going to come to you next. Um, so this idea of investments. Now, I'm sure you, everyone in the room was following um, the G7 summit. Um, and, the, and the EU leaders um, there, they talked about investment of fossil fuel for a short term only. And you had Italy's Prime Minister Draghi saying gas infrastructure is needed for developing nations. And then that can then be converted to use hydrogen in the future. Can it? And where would that leave everything? Mr. Buzek. I'm glad that I can follow because uh, follow my answer because it, it is not an uh, excellent connection. But still, a uh, very uh, simple answer. For me, 2030 is long-term perspective because I cannot imagine uh, a perspective like 2040 or 50, uh, of course, uh, uh, well, uh, 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 climate neutrality from the one thing which could I see. Everything is very difficult to predict. Uh, in two, three years, we can go forward with such uh, important issues like, for example, biomethane because investment in biomethane is two, three years. We can imagine something like that if we are prepared in a good way. In, in seven, eight years, we've got another issues which could be we develop. 
is generally speaking hydrogen and gas package and we uh, expected uh, some help from that side as well so if we divide our perspective on few months because few months it means it's november very short perspective as a very important to fill our gas uh, uh, storage and all our capacities. That's the most important for our citizens, small and medium enterprises. It's very important, but the most question about the coal. Of course, for short term perspective, very short term perspective, it means immediately or in half a year, in two years, maybe three years, not longer. It's very important replacement uh, of gas by coal. In Poland, for example, uh, heating especially in countryside. It is absolutely necessary to use coal, but we don't have enough our own coal in Poland. We should buy it because um, it is necessary to, 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 to have a, a special um, uh, solution for that. So from that perspective, we could see different uh, time uh, uh, um, periods and uh, a taxonomy, by my opinion, because you discussed the issue as well, taxonomy is for longer perspective, rather, because if we start an investment in infrastructure, uh, by the way, in a hydrogen and gas package, because um, I sent to the uh, translation uh, my report, because I'm responsible as rapporteur, for this package. I sent it a few days ago. One week ago, I sent it to, to, to translation to Luxembourg. Uh, from, uh, in this package, we prepared very clear, transparent, and simple way uh, to predict which infrastructure is necessary using ACER, ENSO, ENSO G, uh, and the European Commission, of course, to check everything properly. So from that point of view, we should uh, build such an infrastructure, of course, future-proved infrastructure, not other possibility. So uh, going to coal is absolutely necessary in some member states, and maybe also in Germany and, and the Netherlands. But in two, three years, when we stop using coal, we should go immediately to renewables in such places. Because uh, in general, as a, net, as a net effect in 2050, we should have neutrality. And now we are not so neutral from the point of view uh, of uh, climate if we replace uh, gas by coal, because we know how it is danger for, from point of uh, climate issue. And of course, our health, because smog issue is also very important. So, uh, I don't know, Madame, if I answered your question, because I didn't hear your question once again very properly. I'm sorry about that. Just when I am looking and waiting for your question, it is everything is going wrong in my device. No, I think... I. I think you touched upon um, the question just fine, Mr. Buzek. Um, and to follow up on what Mr. Buzek um, was saying um, about future-proofing pre infrastructure, um, using gas infrastructure for hydrogen, um, Peter, I'll come to you. Um, there seems to be definitely a conundrum here for Europe. There needs to be this sort of gas bridging gap, but also they need to maintain the climate transition drive at the same time. It's... it's, it's a problem, isn't it? Or it's a conundrum? Uh, well, uh, I think we sure like a challenge uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the industry. And so far, we've always been able to rise to, to, to the challenge. Uh, and I'm, I'm confident, ultimately, that we will be able to do that, uh, to do that again. Um, together with the, uh, with the system operators, uh, we've been working in the, in the context of the European hydrogen backbone uh, and actually developing how that system in Europe could uh, could, uh, could could look like, um, and I think that it will start uh, in uh, in northwestern Europe, uh, where actually there is already uh, a 
hydrogen demand. Um, and where certain parts of the infrastructure, I mean, you should just consider it's not just a single pipe going from A to B. And in, in, certainly in this, uh, in, in the northwestern part of, of Europe, we've got multiple pipes uh, lying next to each other. I think that there gradually you will be able to start using uh, part of this infrastructure increasingly for hydrogen. Um, while still maintaining the other part for natural gas, because of course we also know that by 2030, gas demand uh, might be reduced, uh, also depending where you are in Europe, um, but certainly won't be completely phased out by that time. Um, so I think that there will be this gradual shift in using uh, using infrastructure that is currently used for uh, for, for natural gas towards uh, towards hydrogen, and as I mentioned before, it counts for the pipelines, but also for the terminals. A terminal that is uh, suitable to, to actually receive LNG can also uh, receive uh, ammonia, which would be a, an energy carrier to to, to get then uh, uh, towards uh, towards Europe and be changed into to hydrogen to be fed into the uh, into the grid and uh, be be transported wherever it, uh, it needs to needs to go. And I think it, it, it's really good that Mr. Buzik has handed in his report. I think it will be an important. Uh, uh, aid actually to, 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 to develop the market further. The one thing I would call both the European Commission Council and Parliament for is, is, is that next to defining the detailed rules and regulations of how the market will function, we will also need the technical, technological uh, development that supply also for hydrogen needs to be, uh, uh, be, 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 be going. And we can't wait till 2030 to work on that. That's something that we also need to do now. Get also there the supply infrastructure and demand in place. And what I see currently still is, is, is Europe uh, looking very much at the rules and regulations on, on the infrastructure part. Uh, but I think we can uh, put up a, a notch in making sure, uh, certainly also as a result of this crisis, um, that uh, we get the supplies uh, rather sooner than later also for, uh, for hydrogen uh, coming to the market. Okay, uh, Mrs. Amiri, um, you can probably um, follow up on that, but also, um, we'll start taking questions from the audience. This is from Andrea. She says, while technically gas pipelines can be used to transport hydrogen, could you elaborate how the repurposing could take place in times where in the short to medium term pipelines in the West that were meant to be repurposed soon will now be needed for LNG transport? Mr. Demiri, if you could. To me? Oh. Yes, it was for you, yeah. Yes. Well, first of all, in order to, to uh, get uh, uh, large amounts of hydrogen and enough to really decarbonize the uh, European continent, it means you will need to uh, deploy also vast amounts of green energy and, and, and green power. And we see that today we are already lacking this, uh, this uh, green electricity in order to produce either uh, green hydrogen or um, or green ammonia. So uh, I think we really should distinguish the, the short-term perspective from the long-term perspective. In the short term, it's true that uh, the pipelines will uh, be used to uh, flow gas from the West, uh, imported in the form of LNG, and then regasified and, and uh, shipped to other parts of the world, including Central and, and Eastern European uh, countries. Now, in the longer term, it is true that the... Um, the pipeline network can be um, adapted or can or the existing uh, network can be used up to a certain extent. Uh, the, uh, right now, we estimate that you can blend about uh, 5 to 10 percent of hydrogen with natural gas in the pipelines. Otherwise, it means you need to uh, simply uh, replace uh, the network or build a new network for hydrogen. So this is not uh, really the, uh, the ultimate solution. What we see, on the other hand, is that LNG terminals can be used, uh, as was said, uh, to import ammonia as an energy carrier. It requires a few adjustments, like replacing the cryogenic pumps, for instance. Let's talk really about practical uh, matters, because uh, technology is, uh, is very important to, to make that uh, work in, in practice. So you, uh, you, you can replace uh, the pumps, you can use the existing tanks. There are some estimations that uh, the cost of tweaking an existing LNG terminal is about 15%. Uh, it would add 15% to the uh, the cost of this uh, existing facility. So it's doable. Uh, now the energy efficiency of the whole process is still uh, is still an issue. And as I, I said, you need vast amounts of uh, of green energy for that. And so it will take time to develop. You can uh, also uh, develop other forms of gases. 
one of the most efficient uh, ones uh, being uh, synthetic methane, uh, producing methane by uh, using uh, industrial CO2 and and uh, and uh, blending it with uh, mixing it with uh, hydrogen and producing uh, uh, natural gas that can be liquefied uh, or used in the networks directly without uh, adding to the the whole CO2 footprint of the process. So that's basically how we, how we see the uh, energy infrastructure going forward and what we call today uh, uh, future proof uh, ready energy infrastructure which which means that the existing energy energy infrastructure can be used uh, until uh, at least 2040 or 2050 and still contribute to the decarbonization of the uh, of the European Union. Right, I'm hearing that Peter is strongly disagreeing, so we'll go to his strong disagreement first, and then perhaps some of the other panelists can join in. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, well, well, thank you. I mean, with, I mean, what I just heard on 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 whether or not to reuse the the, the, the pipelines. I mean, clearly, I think actually this is a way we should be uh, we should be going. Um, I think the European Union is setting the right direction uh, there. Yesterday, the minister in the Netherlands actually announced also the Dutch government is fully backing the development of, uh, of such a network, which will connect the industrial clusters in the Netherlands and, uh, of course, towards the neighboring states, towards Germany uh, to, uh, to, to enable this transition. I think it is something that will go hand in hand, actually, with the existing terminals that we have in Europe, whereas they are perfectly capable, of course, to continue LNG uh, into, uh, into, into Europe. They're also a great asset to be reused and of course what would be more logical to actually then link them up with the existing uh, pipelines and of course it might depend a little bit from 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 the eu country uh, from where you are in, in in what time frame that will happen uh, or or the industrial setup that you have and for sure in france that is different i know also the position of the french government on it but i see that increasingly uh, in, in in europe governments and infrastructure operators and industry is looking and turning towards hydrogen as a solution uh, to meet actually the 2050 goals. Alex, you want to interject there? Yeah, sure. I was, I was going to say that I completely agree that hydrogen is going to be very important for those sectors which cannot electrify. <clears throat> so that's industry with high temperature heat, some forms of heavy transport. Um, but, but this obsession with um, stranded assets of gas pipelines and reconverting to hydrogen pipelines, I completely agree. Where you can, you should reconvert them. And there's been a lot of work done on that, and it's largely to do with changing the compressors rather than pipelines. The issue is not the infrastructure. And by the way, infrastructure, as in pipeline costs, as a percentage of your final energy bill, are pretty small. Most of it is the supply. And when we come to hydrogen, the challenge is creating that supply. So for example, in Repower EU, uh, the EU has said we want to have 20 million tons of green hydrogen that's produced from renewable electricity using electrolysis by 2030. Of that, half will be imported from where yet to be decided, and the other 10 will be produced in the EU. Now, to produce that, you're going to need a lot of renewable electricity, and they talk about needing 500 terawatt hours. Well, that's actually half or more than half of existing renewable generation in Europe. So in other words, in the next eight years, well, seven and a half years, we somehow need to find you know, another 50% for green hydrogen, and then we need to find all the other electricity because we're going to be using electric heat pumps and stuff. And then the other day, Ursula van der Leyen said that it takes nine years to permit a renewable wind farm. So go figure. Um, okay, there's a question for Andrea, and we'll give it to Mr. Busick since we're talking about hydrogen. Um, Andrea says, what lessons can we draw from the current gas market crisis for the construction of the hydrogen market? Mr. Busick. Mr. Busick. Oh, uh, thank you very much. When, when my time is coming, I'm always hearing worse. So it means uh, secret services are in action. So it's great. Uh, everybody is observing us, so you, you should be very careful now. Uh, well, thank you for the question, but let me say, uh, very important in the case of hydrogen, blending is very important. In my proposal, it was up to 5% in, 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 in member states, and on cross-border connections, interconnectors, uh, below 2%, because as a matter of fact, to use it as a, as a blending source hydrogen uh, is a last resort. We should use it in, in steel industry, in fertilizers. Well, that's the best possible way to use hydrogen, not to mix in with, um, with uh, 
blending to, to the gas pipelines, uh, natural gas pipelines. Of course, different issue is biomethane, of course, because biomethane is absolutely the same as natural gas. Uh, so it, it, it is no problem to, to use biomethane in, in such a way. It's also renewable. Definitions are very important because we should say of oh, green hydrogen, never more green. Colors are not good for naming the hydrogen. It means renewable hydrogen. It means, uh, um, well, uh, producing for renewables uh, sources of, of electricity. That's all, uh, and um, not to use other other word for that. And uh, another very important uh, issue is how to how to minimize the stranded assets. And in, from that point of view, we should try to use as a, as it is possible all the existing gas pipelines for 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 future. It means it was mentioned also ammonia, very important, hydrogen, uh, to use them in the future. Uh, somebody said uh, that we should build a backbone, backbone of our uh, hydrogen uh, assets and, and uh, hydrogen strategies, uh, see something like that, and financing from the European uh, Commission level, because they propose a lot of financing for hydrogen, to build in the infrastructure, uh, to build a special, uh, to create a special way for for uh, for such a such a infrastructure to build and to finance. So all the issues are very important from that point of view, and I think uh, we should uh, we should imagine just now that in uh, 15, 20, 30 years it will be probably only two main energy careers, both, both of them, of course, careers, not the resources. Hydrogen and electricity. Hydrogen maybe 25%, electricity uh, 70%, and the rest, 5%, will be biomethane or biomass. Biomethane or biomass. But hydrogen and electricity, nothing more. And hydrogen also for storage of electricity, absolutely necessary if we want to go to renewables without uh, any gas power station, um, coal power station, in, in very long perspective, 100 years, probably even without any nuclear power station. So it means storage of electricity through hydrogen is absolutely fundamental. Okay, so Mr. Puzik thinks hydrogen and electricity. Um, Mr. Prusa, coming to you then, as we're discussing um, hydrogen, we're talking about alternatives. What about things like wind and solar? And one of our um, audience members has asked a question about geothermal resources and says, this is from Neri, it says, is it suitable for Europe given that technologies used need big investments while drilling deep might cause seismic activity, plus its waste is to be managed too. How green and usable is geothermal alternative? Thank you. Mr. Prusa. Well, um, I think the key point should be that uh, we need to look at uh, decarbonization and de I think that, uh, I think, are our ultimate goals uh, because we see that uh, Russia should not be a major energy source uh, for the imaginable future. So uh, any option that is available, uh, we should pursue. Very often there is a demand. I see it, for example, on the wind energy. A year ago, uh, there would be a lot of communities who would refuse a wind farm. Now, when they see that having a wind farm just uh, close to that uh, settlement actually can decrease the price of their energy, they are now much more willing to actually accept that change in the situation. So I think the public opposition is not uh, as such a major issue as it was in the past. The bigger problem we still have uh, in most of Europe is permitting procedures. It takes way too long to build anything uh, and that is something we need to change. I'm very happy that Actually, the permitting uh, procedures are part of the Repower EU plan. And that's one of the things we want to also focus our presidency work 
to get uh, the permitting uh, up to speed uh, as much as possible. On geothermal, I think, yes, it will need to be a possibility for, for some countries. When you look at uh, the Czech Republic being a landlocked country, limited amount of sun, uh, very limited uh, possibilities for wind energy. We cannot go offshore, uh, unlike most of the countries in the EU. So geothermal is actually one of the few options uh, we still have untapped and we need to look into them. When there are countries when they have uh, different uh, opportunities, I assume they will go into solar or wind uh, because that is tried. Uh, the investments is lower than, for example, geothermal. But again, I, I don't think we can rule out anything at the moment uh, because in the end, if we keep ruling out options, we keep ruling out nuclear, uh, we'll end up with coal and that would be the worst uh, option at all. Okay, lovely. Um, well, we've got less than 10 minutes left, so I'm going to go back to all of our panellists. Um, and Tomasz Prusa, if you'd like to just give your sort of final thoughts on the debate um, and the way forward for Europe. I'm thinking, maybe, maybe let me just make five uh, quick points. One, uh, I think it's absolutely clear that we need to keep building infrastructure and we need to make this infrastructure uh, hydrogen ready. Second point, uh, we need long-term partnerships uh, with uh, suppliers of natural gas and the part of the partnerships we will have with them is how to also help them transition to hydrogen production so that whoever is supplying natural gas might become a hydrogen supplier for us uh, in the near future. Point number three, uh, if we're taking uh, taboos off the table, uh, we need to take all of them off the table, again, including nuclear energy, uh, because for many countries, that is the only viable option they have for uh, low emission uh, energy sources. Number four, uh, speeding up permitting procedures in Europe, because that is uh, what significantly hampers our ability to change and move forward. Uh, we simply take too long. And point number five, that is clear communication to the public. Because what I see, I think we all see it across Europe, people are, are very unsure of what is coming this winter. We need to be very open that it will not be easy, but we also need to show them that even they can contribute with energy savings and every single small action actually counts. Again, we should not be too optimistic, but you know, I think if we are open, people will understand the changes that are necessary. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, over to Mr. Buzik then. Um, and perhaps any advice you have for ordinary citizens as our MEP, you know, representative of the people. Please go ahead, Mr. Buzik. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, ma Madam. If I, if I could say who was at the end, uh, it was very important that we predicted in gas storage regulation uh, uh, quite, quite a new uh, a risk assessment, S minus one, well, it means that from one country, one supplier, all the gas pipelines are stopped suddenly. Like in the case of Russia, uh, Nord Stream 1, Yamal, Brotherhood, and Turkish Stream, four of them completely closed. It is quite a new approach to such an issue. And it means that we should probably need to build a new infrastructure. For such an infrastructure, in another proposal, in our in my hydrogen package, I proposed a European energy security of supply projects. Very clear proposal. Uh, and uh, it can benefit from fast track permitting and financing procedure after the decision of preliminary decision um, study the whole issue by ACER and SOGI uh, and at the end European Commission. So from both sides, because uh, the topic, our topic is uh, gas infrastructure um, and security of gas supply. So uh, answering for that, there are quite uh, clear projects in both in, in uh, uh, gas storage regulation and in in uh, uh, hydrogen uh, package because first of all we need security of gas supply because we need support of european public opinion for our uh, 
uh, attendance to Ukraine, generally speaking, for long perspective, for two, seven, maybe 10 years. It is a long way, not short way. The Ukraine is uh, on, on, on uh, its path to the European uh, Union membership, but it will take a lot of years. And our public opinion should be convinced for that, that from that point of view, security of gas supply, security of energy supply for our citizens and um, uh, overcoming all the shortages is very, very important. All the best to Czech presidency. Next half a year, it will be in your hands and we are count on you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Buzek. Over to Mark Shinovetsky, final thoughts. And if I could ask you all to be just a little bit uh, quick because we have three minutes. Yeah, on the, uh, on the taxonomy, it is very important. It really refers to the cost of financing. Uh, we must uh, declare that both gas and, uh, and nuclear uh, is green. That's, that's my position. Uh, the perspective for private investors, seven years, it's, it's too short. We need to have a longer perspective in terms of infrastructure investments and upstream operations. Uh, then the permitting process definitely important. We can observe right now member states, look at Germany, where th that uh, the use of lex specialis for for the construction of the floating terminal, it is happening. Let's do it at the European uh, at the European level. Climate goals, I think we are too ambitious. I'm not a politician. I can say that. Uh, I speak to the industry. We must, we must reassess the Fit for 55, the, the assumptions of Fit for 55. Uh, we, won't, we won't do it. Uh, uh, we have a different priority right now, which is about energy security. Okay, Alex Barnes, over to you. Okay, I think this debate illustrates one of the problems with the current discussion. Firstly, 2030, it's not long term. Energy investment terms, because of the time it takes to do the projects, it's day after tomorrow. The second thing is we've spent an awful lot of time talking about infrastructure and of that discussion, an awful lot of time talking about stranded assets. This is not an infrastructure problem. This is a supply problem. We've lost our biggest source of low carbon fossil fuel, lower carbon fossil fuel supply, or we may lose it. So we spend, should spend a lot more time talking about increasing supply of renewables and zero carbon, including nuclear, if that's uh, economic. We should focus on build, uh, getting new supplies of natural gas to get rid of coal as quickly as possible. And very, very importantly, we should do a lot more to focus on demand and reducing demand through energy efficiency. And on infrastructure and stranded assets, we should just accept that in order to make sure that we have security of supply so that you don't, your lights and your heating doesn't go off in winter, we are going to have to pay for assets now to fill in those last few bottlenecks. And they may well turn out to be stranded in 10 years if all the renewables come online. But we need them now and we're going to need them for several years to come. So we should just accept the cost because it's relatively small as a percentage of total energy supply. Okay, Vincent de Marie, thank you so much. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'll, I'll try very quickly to summarize and, and, and build on what Alex said. So first of all, we need to be realistic. Replacing a 150 BCM of Russian gas is one third of the LNG market. It won't be done in the night time. It's just uh, not possible. Then we need uh, the right policy signals to make the investments uh, right now, because as Alex said, it is mostly a supply problem. It's not an infrastructure problem for, for the time being, although new infrastructure needs to be developed as well. To, to be able to flow gas and reconfigure the flows. Now, the challenges lie in articulating short-term measures uh, to, to, to relieve the, this uh, crisis with structural measures to reduce demand, to deploy more renewables, and to make sure that we remain on a trajectory of emission reductions, not only at the European level, again, but also at the global level. And uh, right now, the focus is on energy security, but we really shouldn't focus uh, we really shouldn't lose the focus on uh, decarbonization because of that. Peter Van Arsen. Yep, thank, uh, thank you. I think that we also need to be a little bit fair. I mean, you're mentioning 150 uh, BCM uh, Russian gas. Of course, we saw already much reduced volumes of Russian gas coming towards us last winter. So we already are in a different situation. So in that sense, uh, the, the, there might still be a chance that even if the supply is completely stopped, that we will be able to to overcome the challenges that we are that we are that we're facing. Um, fully agree. We need to have a long-term perspective, and that's also about developing the value chain, 
it's for of course uh, the natural gas side uh, to to make sure that we get the uh, the additional volumes we need in in Europe, but especially also for hydrogen, we need to make sure that we develop the supply, the infrastructure, and the demand uh, uh, need to go hand in hand. And then maybe there, and then finally, finally, uh, finally one comment then still uh, on the on the infrastructure is that we need to look to our future system, not looking at gas pipes uh, versus electricity cables versus maybe something else. We need to move towards a system where we're looking towards all those components jointly and make sure that that complete set of infrastructure works to uh, to actually uh, have a robust system that is secure, affordable uh, and uh, sustainable by 2050. Okay, well, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, thank you, of course, to all of our panellists and to everyone who has joined us, um, both online and in person. We hope that... You know, this debate has really given you that sort of flavour, um, you know, about the important discussion around gas supply and infrastructure. I'm Rome Zaid and you've been watching a Euroactive debate in partnership with Gas Infrastructure Europe. Take care and bye bye. Thank you so much.